session in which you will hear from three distinguished speakers. I'm Elizabeth Langland, director of the Lincoln Center for Applied Ethics, one of the sponsors of today's event. I would like to thank our other sponsor, the Institute for Humanities Research. A distinctive feature of today's Zoom event, but perhaps one that's increasingly common, our conversationalists are in four different time zones. I'm on the East Coast. Christy Roschke joins us from Arizona with our support staff, while for Dan Gilmore and Katina Michael, the sun has already risen on tomorrow morning. Dan is in Japan and Katina in Australia. And I want to thank the members of our staffs from both the Center and the Institute who bring this event to you. Erica O'Neill and Tori Vandekop from the Lincoln Center, Liz Grumbach and Lauren Whitby from the Institute for Humanities Research, and our, our filmer, um, Joe Carter from Livestream Success. In the years that have passed since we planned this event, the pandemic of misinformation that arrived on our shores with the advent of the coronavirus has only intensified. Given the way information spreads on social media, it's hardly surprising that we continue arguing, perhaps more vociferously than ever, over wearing masks, preserving social distance, quarantining, washing hands, treating the disease and vaccinating against it. This situation makes our panel on social media and misinformation from four distinguished experts all the more welcome. Our hour will be divided into three parts. During the first 15 to 20 minutes, each speaker will spend five to six minutes addressing aspects of our topic. Then I've asked the panelists to follow up with questions to each other for another 15 minutes. We will then open up the conversation to questions from you, the members of our audience. During our event, you will not be able to access the chat function on your computer. If you want to ask a question, and we hope you will, please use the Q&A function. You may pose questions at any time during the event. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dan Gilmore is recognized internationally as a leader in new media and digital media literacy. He is a co-founder of the News Co Lab at Arizona State University's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. The lab works with partners from academia, media, and technology to improve the public's understanding of how media work and how to be better able to navigate our increasingly complex media ecosystem. A longtime Silicon Valley based journalist, Dan Gilmore wrote a popular business and technology column for the San Jose Mercury News and launched a blog in 1999, one of the first mainstream journalism blogs. He has written two books on the development of digital media, including we the Media, Grassroots Journalism by the People, for the People, and Media Active. He has co-founded two digital media companies and invested in or advised a number of others. It is my pleasure now to present Dan Gilmore. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and uh, I'm blushing from a distance. Uh, and I, I want to thank the sponsors of today's event uh, for doing this. This is uh, important stuff we're talking about, and we have quite a lot to deal with here. Uh, I want to just make a few points to begin with, and uh, I can't wait for your questions, which I think will be, uh, that part will be the most interesting in our whole hour. The key thing I want to start with is that misinformation is not new that it's been around a really long time. And uh, it's been a pretty evil phenomenon for a really long time. And people have been using it to uh, achieve things that they might not have done otherwise. And we have to keep that in mind. There's some context that's always missing from this or frequently. What is new is this confluence of technology bad actors able and willing to use it in a media ecosystem that is just uh, all around us, that, that we are swamped in digital information. And 
that there's a scale available, uh, a bigness of what people can do with this that was not available before. And more than that, people can uh, target us even individually, and that's going to become worse and worse over time. And speaking of scale, I think it's important at the outset of this conversation to point out that uh, a recent study at Cornell University uh, strongly suggests, if not proves, that the number one source of misinformation about the coronavirus and COVID is the White House, and specifically the President of the United States. And that I'm very sad to say that the reason that's the number one source is that uh, traditional big journalism has been a partner in spreading that misinformation, not just a uh, media ecosystem that is to the political right, but really all media, though a lot of it's concentrated on the right. I think that's tragic and it leads to a question of what we can do about all of this. And you'll hear much more details from others about that. But I would like to suggest it's a supply problem and a demand problem that journalism itself is what people in security call an attack surface. In other words, it's, it's uh, a way that bad actors can, it's something they can use as a tool to spread misinformation as we're seeing uh, as, as laid out by the Cornell study. The information that journalists uh, report on that they gather in and then disseminate, they need to be more careful. They need to understand how they're being used and why there's lots of good things for journalists on it. And this will apply to everybody, not just them, which leads me to the uh, other part. I said supply and demand. We, we do need to upgrade our information supply. There's no question about that. We also need to upgrade us. That's the users, the consumers of information. And I use uh, I use information and so do you more than you really consume it. And we have to do that at scale as well. So how do we do that? Well, we have to do it in really three different ways. There are three different institutions in our society that can contribute. And Christy and I uh, are working on that from the demand side. The education is one of the big institutions and that's making progress. We're, we're getting better at that in the education world. Uh, that is something that could scale, but in very different places, people have different uh, activities. The media themselves should be another player, another help in getting this upgrading of us into the popular culture more so. It's not been something media have done, uh, which again is tragic because it's a missed opportunity, but there are plenty of opportunities for journals and other media institutions like the entertainment business, the public relations advertising business to play a big role in helping us do better at sorting out what's true, what's false, what's real, what's not, and to make better decisions for ourselves and to understand how media work, which is something that most people don't. And then finally, social media companies have to be a big, big player in helping us sort this out. I am vehemently opposed to the idea that Facebook, Google at all should be the editors of the internet, which by the way, is what a lot of people are demanding. I think that's, tri that's terrible. What they could do more of, and they're not doing enough of, is to help us be better at it ourselves. And there are plenty of things they could do. I'll stop there and really look forward to hearing from fellow panelists and from you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for those illuminating comments. I'm really looking forward to our discussion already. As a reminder to our viewers, you can submit questions in the Q&A throughout this event to be addressed by our panel at the end. Please do so. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Katina Michael. Dr. Michael is a professor at Arizona State University, holding a joint appointment in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society and the School of Computing, Informatics and Decision Systems Engineering. 
She is also the director of the Society Policy Engineering Collective and the founding editor in chief of the IEEE Transactions on Technology and Society. Dr. Michael is a senior member of the IEEE and a public interest technology advocate who studies the social implications of technology. She is the senior editor of the socioeconomic impact section of IEEE Consumer Electronics Magazine and was the editor in chief of the award winning IEEE Technology and Society Magazine. In 2019, she took on the role of working group chair for the IEEE P2089 standard. In 2017, she received the Brian M. O'Connell SSIT Distinguished, Distinguished Service Award. It's my pleasure to present Dr. Michael. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And also, what a joy to be on this panel with Dan and Christy. I'm just so taken today. Um, where do I begin? I think I'm going to begin with the perennial question, what is truth? It's that question that Pilate asks Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John. Uh, and it's about aletheia, truth, or disclosure in philosophy. Aletheia is variously translated as unclosedness, unconcealedness, disclosure, or truth. And the literal meaning of the word aletheia in Greek is the state of not being hidden, the state of being evident. And what is evidence? And so to this, what does Jesus Christ answer to Pilate? Possibly many of the critics reflect nothing. He was almost dumb in silence. The question is, today, can we ask a bot what is truth? Can we ask an auto journalist what is truth? And so the question as we're being hit with all of these vectors of information is whether we can denote in this messiness the source, the authenticity, the authorship. Where did this fact, this supposed fact, come from? Who wrote it down? Who was quoted? Who copied it down? Were there any transcription errors? So authorship, authenticity, and automation. So the question here is, you can converse with a human who are you and what are you talking about and give me the evidence, but how can you say that with a machine? And so now we have machine generated journalism using artificial intelligence. And perhaps that is the current problem, the algorithms and the echo chambers they're creating and the micro targeting they're doing, as Dan said, to the individual level, no longer the household, but to us, the person. And so there's a multitude of issues here We've lost touch with the physical world around us. Our brain is living in cyberspace. So if we've lost our physical connection to reality, how can we even think about denoting whether something is true or untrue? So I advocate we've got to have experience. We've got to touch the real world, the physical world, to actually do our own experiments, our own trial and error, instead of watching that game and chopping the cucumbers uh, in the game, we actually get a knife and start chopping in the real world and start cooking real things. And then we know, oh, does the knife hurt? So this is the issue. We have these vectors of information and the further away we go from the physical reality of the world, the harder it is to denote because our brain cannot process the amount of images, the number of images, the number of text messages, the number of voicemails, we're analog and the digital is digital. So with those opening comments, I'll return to you, Elizabeth, and uh, carry on the conversation. Wonderful. Th thank you so much, Katina, for your insightful comments. I do look forward to hearing more shortly in the panel discussion. And to our viewers, again, please continue to submit questions to be addressed at the end. Now I'd like to introduce our final guest speaker for this event, Dr. Christy Roschke. Dr. Roschke is the managing director of the News Co Lab, the ASU Cronkite School Initiative that I mentioned Dan Gilmore co-founded. It's aimed at helping people find new ways of understanding and interacting with news and information. 
She researches and teaches media literacy for learners of all ages in formal and informal educational settings. She previously served as executive director of KJZZ Spot 127 Youth Media Center, a community initiative of the Phoenix NPR member station that mentors the next generation of digital storytellers. Dr. Roshke has taught journalism at the high school and university levels for 17 years. It is my pleasure now to present Dr. Roshke. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks for so, say so much for having me and thanks to the, the previous panelists for their very provocative and insightful opening comments. Um, I'm going to kind of bring it down maybe to a little bit more specific level about the coronavirus um, and kind of what we're dealing with right now so that we can kind of take some of these big issues and, and match them with people's experiences. So as a, as a teacher, I'm, I'm always on the ground with students kind of helping them one-on-one -on -one and as a group kind of navigate these things. And I find Dr. Michael's comments so interesting about how we've sort of lost you know, our, our touch with and we're, we're far, farther removed from some of the things that create information. And, and I might argue that it, that's definitely true, but in some ways we're actually even more in touch with the ways we create information than ever before, because we're all creating information thanks to our use of social media and in some of these channels, we, we don't have to rely on others to create that information. Um, having said that, I do think you're right that um, the process of creating information, whether it's automated or it is actually a person you know, taking notes on the street, is quite foreign to people. I think we have this notion that that journalism or reporting is actually pretty straightforward and, and sure those practices are, but not a lot of people really take the time to think about what that means. And so we tend to take information um, from one source as it would be from another without really discerning the process behind it. And that's kind of where I sit in and what I do every day is helping people parse that process, whether it be automated or, or you know, human oriented, or it's been you know, crowdsourced in some way. Um, I think that those are really confusing issues for people. And right now, as we're living through a pandemic, you know, we're going on, geez, almost a year since this breaking news story mm -hmm. started. We're living in a breaking news story. So every day brings mm -hmm. something new. Um, and what's unique about this breaking news story, I guess, is its length, its duration, but also that this is so novel that the experts we typically look to to help us make sense of this aren't experts. You know, they are in their fields and they're doing the best they can to catch up but we're all playing catch up. And so that's the medical professionals who are trying to figure out what this virus is and what the best you know, prevention methods are. And that's the journalists who are then reporting what the, what the medical experts say. And then so our government official is trying to make policy and, and help guide us in, in doing the things we do in our daily life um, based on all of this information. Um, but it's unfolding you know, literally daily. And so what we've seen in terms of misinformation a lot is, um, you know, one day's fact is the next day's, you know, misguided truth or it's untruth, you know, or, or the vice versa. One day's you don't need a mask. I think that's the perfect example. Yeah. Matt, you know, there are reasons why we didn't, we were told not to wear masks at the beginning, some straightforward and maybe some less so. Now we know that that's probably the number one thing that we can do to prevent the spread of coronavirus. And yet there, this, this, this false equivalency persists so maybe it's true, maybe it's not. And that's partly because we, we heard something one day and then we're hearing something different now and we don't know how to make sense of that. And the, the journalists who are reporting this also kind of don't help that by perpetuating this idea that it is still a question. It's not a question anymore, we, we just need to do it. And, and so as we're covering this story and facts are emerging, it becomes very difficult for us as users of media to keep up. Um, and I've just been reading a lot today about how, as we're headed into winter time here in, 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 you know, in the West and our Northern hemisphere, and we are uh, getting into flu and cold season, um, we're, we're fatigued by this idea that we have to continue to live through this pandemic. And we're also fatigued by the news of it, which makes it even harder for us to, to accept maybe sometimes the things that we're hearing. And, and if we don't want to believe them, we're just sort of done. Um, and so it's this kind of spiral of overload that we're in that opens the door to rumors and hoaxes and false narratives um, to take hold with people who are just kind of spent. Um, and I think I'll probably stop there so we can get to some conversation. Wonderful. Thank you, Christy, for your important insights. 
we'll turn to our viewers' questions in a moment, and they are coming in, thank you. Uh, but first, I'd like to invite our panelists to share their responses to and questions for their fellow speakers. Katina has agreed to moderate, so it's my pleasure to turn this over to Katina. Thank you, Elizabeth. Riveting from all, all of us. Um, Dan, I'd like to begin with you. You identified three sources that we need to consider in particular. You talked about the government, um, companies and big tech and so forth. Tell us about the interplay. Tell us about the value chain. Who's behind this misinformation? Do, can we identify uh, these players in the interplay? Uh, well, at some level, they're all of us. Uh, and in, including us, people on this call and who are listening, we, uh, I'll start with us because one of the things that is part of being human is wanting to believe things because we believe them and therefore uh, finding reasons to believe them and then sharing, which is now the easiest thing in the world to do, things that we see that <clears throat> may or may not be true. And uh, one thing that we can all do that would be great is to uh, wait a minute before we share anything uh, to make sure that it's actually true. Something Twitter has just done uh, in the run up to the election that I think is uh, wonderful is a, I'm not sure if they've rolled it out for everybody, but for some people anyway, if they want to share something political, they actually have to uh, click through and read it as opposed to just sharing it based on the headline. I think that's a speed bump uh, that is a wonderful idea and that Facebook should implement, you know, yesterday. Uh, YouTube should uh, find ways to include this, WhatsApp, all of the various platforms. But that's not enough, that it's still going to be on us to be more careful. And I, I say that having been a uh, uh, very uh, misguided sharer of things that are wrong from time to time, and I feel terrible at, about having done that. But the I, I didn't fully answer, but the technology industry can do so much to help us that that they have not done. And I'm gently trying to persuade them to do more. And Dan, with the recent um, allegations against these big tech platforms for censoring, potentially, if we can use that word, uh, material that was to be published by the New York Times, uh, how do you feel about that? Is that something you can comment on? Uh, well, it I, two things. One is I, uh, I don't think that uh, unless it's on orders of a government that we should call what a private company does censorship. I think uh, censorship is an activity reserved to government, period. Mm -hmm. uh, they are exercising uh, their right to edit, which is both fine with me and not fine with me, given their clout in the information uh, marketplace, if you will. They have so much control over what people say and do. That said, they have the right to do it. And uh, there are certain cases where I nod my head saying, thank you for doing that, even as my skin crawls a little bit about the implications of them doing it. Mm -hmm. So this is a double-sided, uh, double-edged sword. Thank you so much, Dan. I had once read somewhere on, I think, even your Wikipedia entry that you denote expertise to the citizen. And I found that very interesting. The experts are the ones who are engaged in the practice. Um, Christy, I find, I find all that you had to say so enthralling. Um, I'm reading stuff from Greg Zachary at the moment, who was also a former journalist and um, probably still writing in this space. And he talks about the vulnerability that we have when things are free, when citizen journalism is free, when we don't have to pay for anything. He says, imagine pizza was free and you could have all you wanted, you know, what then? And, and so what is this idea about information being free and does that lead to misinformation? And I think you alluded to some of that in your commentary. Well, I think, I mean, that's an interesting point. I, I think 
I guess I would argue that we've never really paid for information in the same way we pay for pizza. Um, that usually the information, you know, we were we were we were paying for advertising basically, and you know, and, and the idea that we would that we weren't paying for individual news stories. We information's always been well underfunded. Um, and so I think we've just come to believe that we should have access to information, you know, at the click of a button and particularly younger generations who've never known any different. I mean, I think that I taught high school for 12 years and at the start of that, there was no social media, there were no smartphones and seeing the evolution of how they um, came to find information, it became so much easier that then I would say, yes, the value of information became less important because they could, they didn't have to ask for or want for anything. Um, I would love to see, you know, we're seeing the real ramifications of what happens when people don't want to pay for information. So we're seeing our, our journalism industry, you know, dying because people aren't subscribing to newspapers. They don't have to. Um, so yeah, I think that definitely opens the door to misinformation because we can all create both good and bad information and it costs the same. Um, and, and it's the same experience for us on the user's end. Um, and even more so now that it, it's you know, so easy to create a very convincing looking website or to have a very convincing looking social media profile. Um, I think that that cost is very important. But again, like Dan said, this isn't a new problem. We've, we've, uh, we've never really valued in terms of like money, you know, information. And, and we've always been susceptible to misinformation maybe in part as a result of it. People have paid for some kinds of misinformation. Entertainment is the number one. Um, and people pay for timely information if money is involved. Uh, they'll, they'll pay a lot for information in those cases. Uh, it, but as a friend has said, the half-life of a scoop is about one minute these days. So it, it's hard for journalists to monetize regular stuff. Uh, we can do a lot about that, but it's not a it's not a given that we have a business model to support what we traditionally have called uh, journalism. We're working on that. Do you, either of you, believe that um, there is planned disinformation to destabilize geopolitical, geopolitically nations? Um, and how much of that do you think is actually effective? All this noise, all this drowning out of hashtags, all these drowning out of handles, these fake bots, these fake accounts, now in the thousands uh, for individual profiles. I think one statistic I read said that 1% uh, of handles generated like 90% of the uh, you know, scandal against I'm with her hashtag uh, when Hillary Clinton was uh, going for, for, for election. So the question I have is, is it effective? Is it working? And are there plan is there planned disinformation between other state and non-state actors? Chrissy? Well, so yes, there is. I mean, I think we, there's been plenty of evidence to support uh, government interference um, via concerted disinformation campaigns. Um, to your point though, I mean, and, and yes, I think it's worked. I think it's worked because it sowed so much confusion that we now, um, as, a, as a populace, will see, you know, maybe a, a partisan opinion piece in a newspaper and think, oh, that's government interference. You know, it's worked in the case that we don't understand the difference between. So to your point that there's a very small number of, of actors producing so much noise, the same thing holds true for people who actually are consuming and sharing quote unquote fake news. It's a very small percentage of the people impacted by it. Most people are not either coming in contact with it or sharing it, but the narrative around it, because it has created so much confusion and, and to your point about what is truth, this is this existential threat that we're all facing. What is truth? So now we're kind of like, oh, I, this seems sketchy to me. I wonder if Russia planted it. You know, <laughs> that's where our brains kind of automatically go. Dan, did you have any comments? Uh, I'll echo mostly what Christy said, uh, but there's plenty of uh, evidence that this stuff works. And the the... The, the question about where more of it's coming from is separate to that. The, again, I, I've been uh, thinking for a long time that the, the, the bulk of political misinformation that more people 
hear more of it out of traditional media via their reporting on what certain people in the White House say has been a, in my view, a significant problem. And uh, studies are now coming out to show that that's actually true. We, uh, but don't dismiss the influence of the small, put it in quotes, actors who are uh, working the edges. And I've seen very persuasive evidence that in 2016, there was a concerted campaign to dissuade in the United States to dissuade black voters from participating and uh, through uh, a series of very targeted, highly targeted, personally targeted uh, uh, Facebook posts and others. So we have a lot to deal with here. I think I have one major burgeoning question and that is what are we going to do about this? So we've got social media galore. We love it and we hate it. Uh, we're using it. We've got big tech heavily involved. We've got government actually tweeting. Uh, we've got presidents tweeting. Uh, we are finding it hard to make sense from all of these different vectors of engagement. So what are we going to do about it? Well, we've got technologists trying to combat the problem in a technological means. What other avenues do we have? Christy, we'll start with you perhaps. That's a great question, and I hope you'll you'll answer your own question too. Because I'd like to hear what you say. Um, but I think, um, I mean, there's there's no one thing we can do or should do. We have to do all the things, um, and part of that is inter interdisciplinary. I like what you said. You've got technologists looking at the technology side of it, but that just gets at the technology. And we need, you know, I, I'm a media literacy researcher and, a, and a, have a journalism background, and we need, you know, we need cognitive psychologists, we need sociologists, anthropologists, we need interdisciplinary teams attacking the problem, not only of why the technology works the way it does and how we can stop it from that level, but also why we work the way that we do and what, um, you know, our propensity as, as groups, as individuals is to, to both be conned and to want to con, um, as the case may be, and to you know make critical decisions on the information that we share, how we how we decipher those things. So I think it's a lot of different solutions coming from groups of people who are looking at this problem, you know, from their specific discipline and then teaming together. I think is a good place to start. That's great, and Dan. Well, what she said. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it it. I, I just think the, the the key point there is that <clears throat> the, the the wish for some perfect answer that's, that's simple <clears throat> is of course uh, just not going to happen. That <clears throat> to uh, use in a different context, a friend said about what would save the journalism business. The answer is well, nothing will save it. Everything might. So nothing will fix this, but everything might. And we have to work on every single front uh, because the people who are trying to con us and, and divide us and harm us are working on every single front. Uh, we better confront them where they are. Well, Dan, uh, you know, you've just elicited thoughts of houses being divided. Really, they are. Uh, because this combat now, this conflict 2.0 is occurring at the individual level, I think you're right. But when you, div you know, divide households on perspectives, then you're there for a very interesting turn of events. And we've seen that particularly with uh, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, and also uh, households being divided about where they stand about our recent events in America, um, which has been troubling on a number of scales. Um, particularly first for the actual event that took place, uh, the death of this individual. Um, I want to say as well uh, that we have a major responsibility uh, as academics to raise awareness in raise education levels. One of the things that uh, Zachary talks about is that people love to cling to stories. They're easier than quantitative data. They're easier than interpreting graphs. We feel comfortable. There's something, there's a comfort level with yeah. stories, but also, as things develop in the technological sense, our deep fakes will become more sophisticated. We're now just not talking about words, but videos that are being tampered with. Mm -hmm. The deep fakes that show different people engaged in different activities and this authenticity that is lacking. You know, was it that person? Wasn't it? Was it a deep fake? And then the response being another deep fake. 
to cancel out the deep fake to begin with. So what level? Does this become like a, a global offset of some type uh, that is used uh, for beyond this information propaganda for actual harm? So I do think technology has a role to play in solving the problem that they created. <laughs> As a public interest technologist, I do say that. And I think the blockchain has a lot to do with it. Actually identifying, we have verified accounts. Why don't we have verified information? Uh, who wrote it? At what time? We need the vintage of the data. We need to know where the data was generated, who generated it. And there is syndication, but also remuneration. There has to be some engagement, some foundation to say, well, I created the data. Chris, in your case, it could have been your students. You know, it could have been someone that is an expert in the field. But how do we garner the authentication, the remuneration back to the individual to clean up what the internet has become, uh, and particularly social media? Christy, I'm not sure if you have any reflections on that. Well, I think, I think it's an interesting idea. And I think we've seen some efforts in the blockchain space to try to tag information, particularly when it comes to photos and video, I've seen some efforts. Um, I've also seen it have try to make blockchain um, more integral into the journalism process, which efforts thus far, at least in the States have, have failed because it's very confusing for people, um, not only for the people you know, engaging in reading the journalism or consuming the journalism, but also the journalism industry as, as well. I mean, it's just, it's very confusing, but I, I think your point about um, being able to authenticate and enumerate is really, really well taken. And particularly as we're finding global information coming from disparate places um, and, and open, we're not, we don't, we don't all have those open source investigation skills to be able to track that back ourselves. So this allows a bit of a shorthand for people who who don't have the time or the wherewithal to be able to investigate that potentially. I, I jump in the, uh, for those uh, on the call who don't know what blockchain thing is we're talking about. Uh, blockchain is basically think of it as a ledger uh, keeping track of everything that has gone on in a specific environment that is uh, keyed to that. Uh, and it's an intriguing idea to uh, tag information uh, with blockchain with or some system of that kind. I, I have a lot of questions about its viability, uh, partly because let's use an example if you could if you could authenticate a photograph and then if even one yeah. pixel changed, you'd have to unauthenticate it. But mm -hmm. the problem is that with uh, photographic, with software that exists, not for misinformation purposes, but just to clean up a photo to make it better, okay. you've changed pixels. And are we gonna de-authenticate it as a result of that? What mm -hmm. if it's uh, transposed into a different format? Ooh, you changed a bunch of pixels. There's a there, there are a lot of issues with blockchain, and I think it has promise, but I think that there's a long way away. And the, the final thing on that is that I don't like the idea of absolute control over information, which this would lead to. Uh, and part of how things get created is that we stand on each other's shoulders. And uh, I can foresee big problems with over assertion of things like copyright as a result of blockchain. But I apologize to people who are listening if this is all gibberish. No, Dan, they're excellent comments, particularly with joint authorship, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and also whistleblowers who don't really want to yeah. be disclosed by name, uh, key right. informants and so forth. Okay. I think you raised some excellent points there. Um, Elizabeth, are we at that point where you would like to go to questions? I'm seeing lots of questions come up here on the they panel. Are, the questions are, in fact, pouring in. So <laughs> I think this is a great moment. Um, thank you all for these rich and provocative insights. And obviously, they've stimulated our viewers. So let me start with a question. And, and to some extent, uh, you've answered some of these questions partially. But I'm going to give you an opportunity, even if you have to uh, address them again. First question coming in, I'd love to know what Dan and others think tech companies would ideally do to help people consume the news in a more informed way. Uh, I think you threw that one to me first. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, that was a questioner who did I, that. Yeah, I, uh, 
you know, where to start. Uh, there's so many things that could be helpful. I'm going to back it up a level, though, before I do that one. And that is that the, I think the concentration of power in the technology industry is a huge problem and that we need government intervention okay. there to create more competition, or at least the conditions where more competition could flourish. Uh, so that that control that I worry about would would be lessened, and there are technologies being developed to actually re decentralize uh, the, the the technology we use. I think that would be helpful on one level and harmful on another. The it, but given the companies today, I think there's so much they could do. I would like, for example, I'll give you just a, one simple example. I would love it if Facebook. Uh, would put some speed bumps in for sharing so that it's a little yeah. harder to do uh, as Twitter did with some political uh, mm -hmm. links. And I'd like to see Facebook uh, do give users their own dashboard so that they can change the nature of their newsfeed themselves. Uh, with, for as another example, I would love a button that says, burst my filter bubble and that what it would do and i'd yeah. like to have granular control over that too but i would like it to say send me things from people i have uh, shown who i trust mm -hmm. that i'm not going to agree with you know what i'm going to already agree with because you watch everything that i do so <laughs> send me stuff i'm not going to agree with now i do that routinely myself i i make it a practice to read and watch things that I know are going to make my blood boil, but most mm -hmm. people don't. And we have to train ourselves to get out of our, uh, mm -hmm. our the, and bubble is the really wrong word, but it's a, we are, con we condition ourselves to not be uncomfortable as is normal, mm -hmm. but we need to be a little more uncomfortable and we could use some help. Thank you. I, I think I'm going to, although I know the others would have, uh, answers to this. I'm going to move on with questions just to get as many in as possible. So we have a question actually addressed to you, to you, Katina. Would you walk us through the issue of truth or truth in the algorithm? I'm thinking of distal and proximal implications of trust. When we face others who could harm us, we use proximal and distal language to signal control of those others, placing others opposite of us. This can be seen talking about different groups like religion, ethnic, or political groups. What a question, very loaded, may I, may I add? Mm -hmm. um, I guess we're moving towards uh, a lot of artificial intelligence in the Australian landscape, for example. Uh, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation has literally let hundreds of journalists go and in a small country of about 26 million people. Mm -hmm. That is a huge impact. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing the destruction of journalism in Australia and the destruction of even academia in Australia. It's, it's a very sorry time uh, to reflect on these two groups of people. They're our truth tellers, right? Academics and journalists. And both of these areas have been targeted to the point that we believe we're dulling down our intelligence in Australia as a result. So where to from here? I've had people from Germany interview me to discuss uh, the automation of journalism. Surely we can create automated feeds Surely we can write better than the journalists themselves. We have the algorithms, but who's writing these algorithms? What's the motivation behind the algorithms? Are the algorithms black boxes? Sure, we can touch up structure and we can touch up grammar. We can make a beautifully flowing story today using AI better than humans, potentially, potentially. But the question still becomes, what are we uh, pointing to here? W what are we actually claiming uh, with the story we're telling? Where did that story come from? And so explainable AI is something that people are investing time into trying to say, well, we don't know what the algorithm itself is doing once we let it loose via a neural network, but in fact, we can explain it to you like this. This is the first step, this is the second step. And this is what you come out with, well, good luck. So I think we are distancing ourselves, despite that we're using this term explainable AI, I actually don't think we can explain how a story is generated and the sources that it crawls through the internet to find. We've got crawling engines today, scraping photographs from everywhere. One company has 3 billion of these images, just 
continuously crawling the internet and social media for anything open and downloading these images. Well, who knows what's going to happen? We're already creating beings that even don't exist in terms of their face uh, and so forth. So my question there is, we've got a lot of work to do to reconcile this black box and this explainable AI because it will never really be truly explainable. And that's the difficulty if we go down this path and rely on Autobots to auto-generate information. Okay. Thank you. I'm going, to, I'm going to direct a question to Christy because this one is specifically about COVID. And uh, during COVID, we're experiencing scientific inquiry and discovery in real time. Yet our scientific literacy is seemingly deficient and there is much competition among scientists for column inches in the news. How do we help the public navigate such challenges? That's a really, really good question. And it's, it does touch on a number of issues that we we're facing with, again, this, this constant stream of information. So we were already inundated with information before this, and now we'll just add, let's try to figure out a novel virus on top of it. And, you know, it's been really impressive to see all these preprint publications coming out and the way that scientists are collaborating so that work can spread faster. So the, you know, the knowledge spreads faster, but it also has had sort of a negative impact in some ways because we now have access to these preprints without understanding what a peer review process looks like or what consensus looks like. And I guess that's a good place to start is I've, you know, I've talked about this a lot with science classes is that in science we teach, you know, the how to of whatever field of science we're in, you know, so we're doing lab experiments where we're making things blow up and that seems cool and fun, but we don't spend any time in science talking about how science is actually produced and how that knowledge is shared. So the field of academia is very um, foreign to most people. So when we talk about the way that we, we come to know things and the way that we typically share it and those, 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 you know, think steps, measures we have in place to ensure that that information is is valid and credible and reliable. Um, all of those processes are not commonplace for the typical person. And now that we are putting, again, we're sort of crowdsourcing this information, which is both good and bad because we don't stop to explain to those of us who aren't involved in that process what all of this means. Um, and it's hard even for medical experts. You know, if you're a family physician, for instance, you're not necessarily an infectious disease expert or an epidemiologist. You're trying to treat your patients and answer your patients' questions at a very specific granular level when you don't know. And then it's hard to hear, wait, my doctor doesn't know what's happening. Um, so I think uh, we can do a lot in the realm of education, um, both formally and informally to explain how science works and the fact that it is an iterative and evolutionary process. Um, that's a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow, but that's where we are right now. And I think that, again, opens mm -hmm. the door when we don't have definitive answers um, that allows people to come in and say whatever they want to say. And that sounds just as good as those non-definitive scientific answers. Um, so I think it's, it's something that uh, science um, educators should be thinking more about mm -hmm. um, as they're teaching you know, students of all ages. Thank you. Um, there's kind of an open question here that I'm going to throw out to the group. And um, it's, uh, the, uh, do you have any comments or knowledge on misinformation detection technologies? Uh, I'm sure Katina would have plenty <laughs> to discuss there. Uh, I, I will say Christy and I are part of a group uh, working uh, with the teams around the country on the, the uh, video misinformation and mm -hmm. detection and things like that. There, there's a lot going on, but Katina probably knows a hundred times more than I do. Uh, Dan, very modest. I don't think I do, but um, I do look at and have colleagues who are working in the space of video tampering, uh, image tampering, even textual tampering. You know, the, the difficulty in this space is that you could have an, an imperfect article that's been peer reviewed, it looks legit, mm -hmm. and there could be just one drop, you know, uh, in the whole article, which is just wrong. Uh, and that's, that's really, you know, calculated. It, it's what Christy was talking about before, perfect websites and yet shonky data sources. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like taking a clean cup of water you know, you drink it, no problem if it was clean. If just one drop of something yucky, you, you wouldn't touch it. And that's what is happening today. And it's 
it's easy to fabricate and manufacture. Um, I was inspired uh, when I gave a keynote in 2014 in Beijing at the Minds Conference at IEEE by the movie The Final Cut, which features uh, the late Robin Williams as a cutter. And his job was to be hired by the family to cut out all the messy bits of the spouse. And that's just showing me potentially we could have that in this world of constant surveillance, constant video, constant feeds, constant Facebook, constant whatever. Um, people want to be untagged. They want to cut out. They don't want to be seen somewhere. They don't want their location coordinates traced or tracked to a particular place, you know, for different reasons, some of them very legitimate. Um, Domestic violence, for example, is one of them. Uh, one of my students in the public interest technology degree we have at SFIS is studying this phenomenon, a location-based services and domestic violence. Well, you don't want an accurate representation of where that woman or man has been. Um, so I think that's a, a great area of, of exciting research that has to be done, is being done. Uh, even here at the University of Wollongong in Australia, uh, Lei Wang has been, you know, an amazing professor who's been looking at how do you know when evidence has been tampered, but that becomes almost forensic. And then again, we go back to that blockchain, this chain of custody forensics that we experience in the DNA world. Uh, mm -hmm. And is that gonna happen today uh, with images and writing and other things? So the, the vintage, the source, the updates, who upgraded? But Dan, I, I love your opening comment. We have to upgrade ourselves. I, I keep coming back to both that point that you made mm -hmm. and what Christy said. Christy said something about um, the writer uh, and so we start with factual information if we ourselves are factual in the sense we're not lying. If we are not the expert, we, we basically say, sorry, I can't comment on this. Um, and, and, and academics now are constantly called experts of this and that and everything else. And we're not, you know, we still have our niche. Yes, there are interdisciplinary people. There are transdisciplinary scholars uh, that are perhaps in multidisciplines. But I think both of you are right. How do we upgrade ourselves? How do we do better in communicating facts? Thank you. Thank you. Um, what do you all think about um, asking people to pay a fee to post or repost a piece of information on social media? What would happen then? Well, I think that would probably kill social media. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think. You know, you can think of a fee and sort of, I, you know, I like to use this term, Dan said it before, the speed bumps um, mm -hmm. you, you can put in place in technology platforms that, that stop people from having ill-advised knee-jerk reactions to things. Um, because, you know, a lot of research would indicate that the reason why we share things is, is for social capital. So it's, and, and if our group is a group that we want to seem smarter and more intelligent for, then we might take the time to fact check something. But if instead our group is someone that we want to seem more like provocative or, you know, funnier, uh, we might have different motivations for sharing different types of information. Um, and there's a lot of research around that, like why people share the things that they do in their social circles. So I think, I don't, I don't see how a fee-based system could work personally, but I do think there's other ways that you could sort of monetize the consequences for sharing information that's not factual um, and keeping people from just kind of willy-nilly sort of spouting off whatever they feel in the moment. Because usually we regret it. Well, maybe <laughs> but I think most, most people who try to be of sound judgment regret it after they do something like that. And I think, Christy, great Thank points. You. And I always think nothing is free. We're being sold this model yeah. that social media is free. In fact, there's advertising, complex advertising, mm -hmm. ratios, plans, uh, executions of therein. Nothing is free in social media world. And reposting is interesting because uh, the majority of reposts I'm going to claim are not coming from humans. They're coming from calculated apps and APIs that work with Twitter, work with Facebook, work okay. with the Google platform. And so you're yes, probably thinking, you know, I can hardly survive the onslaught as an academic of social media, you know, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, 5 a.m., 9 a.m. There are people using automated platforms to share okay. and generate information. So in this realm of this business model has to change. This is the problem we're seeing antitrust issues in Australia. We're seeing the ACCC in Australia basically slap Google and Facebook on the back of the uh -huh. hand and saying the, the content is not free. Start paying for it. You know, there are people who are, who are sweating blood actually generating the content. Start remunerating those journalists who have lost their jobs. Uh -huh. So I, th I think coming away with what Christy said, if we, if we charged, it, it'd collapse. But the other thing is 
it's not free on the back end. We've got AdWords that are generating what Dan called filter bubbles and recommender systems fueling our next view. And if you put it on autoplay, you're just going to see the next one, the next one, the next yeah. one, and like a drone. So, so what are we going to do to change this business model? And that's the challenge I have for big tech. Uh, thank you. I think our next question builds very much on, on where you've all been uh, moving us. And this is, there's breaking news every day. What are the absolutely critical lessons about misinformation that we need to bring to the public? And or how can collaborations between media and academia make those critical lessons a reality? Got three educators here. <laughs> I'll, I'll make one quick. Uh, we can uh, we can be skeptical of everything, but not equally skeptical. That you, that is to use judgment. We can. Uh, I think we can assume if 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 something we see on social media from someone we don't know, or shared by someone we do know from someone we don't know, that makes us angry there's a very high likelihood it's been designed to do that uh -huh. and to push our buttons, don't let them do it. Um, and I, I, I the, the constant flow of news, I, I do have one bit of advice, which is turn it off. Uh, take, take a break from Facebook, Twitter at all, and television. Uh, you know, go for a walk. I, I don't, we, we are, we're just too addicted to this stuff. And we need mm -hmm. to realize that there's a lot out there. It doesn't solve the other problems, but we can do a lot more for ourselves personally than we are doing at the moment. Thank you. Katina, Christy, would you like to speak to that? Yes, I think the seductive nature of these devices seductive <laughs> and if we let them it's all persuasive technology design right stickiness okay. drivers designed there it's addiction okay. by design friends and so dan gilmore you've said exactly what philosopher michael eldred said a couple of weeks ago distance yourself from that which is the generator okay. uh, and as i said in the beginning i, I agree mm -hmm. in, in terms of that side experiential go for a walk touch the sand <laughs> Go for a yeah. hike. Smell the fresh air outside. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. I have, uh, and we're, we're just about out of time, but I have one more question. How do you combat confirmation bias where individuals consume their truth from limited sources? Christy? Sure, I think Dan spoke a little bit to that uh, before in terms of just opening your mind to things and, and, mm -hmm. and establishing a greater awareness of the fact that maybe you are choosing the things that support your already deeply held beliefs in terms of the media that you consume. And every now and again, um, checking in on the other side. I don't think it's possible to really navigate this world at this point if you don't understand what maybe other folks are are seeing in their media feeds. Um, and so it's important to, to broaden your horizons in that way. Um, I guess that's kind of what I would say. Thank you so much. Uh, we've just about used up our time. I, I can't believe it. We still have many people who would love to ask questions. This is obviously a topic we'll need to return to. But I'd like to thank all of our viewers for joining us today. And thanks to our staff for their support and a special thanks to our distinguished speakers, Dan Gilmore, Katina Michael, and Christy Roschke. If there's anyone who wishes to forward this session uh, to someone else, it will be available for you on YouTube and Facebook. On behalf of the Lincoln Center and the Institute for Humanities Research, I thank you for joining us today.